Hey, Michael. So uh, what do you think of all this cold weather we're having? Yeah, what do you think of it? Yeah, yeah. Hey, Michael, what do you think about Karl Marx? You have any feelings about Marxism, communism? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Me too. My, <laughs> my thoughts exactly. All right. Let's learn about Marxism. Enough with the Depeche Mode, and let's learn a little something about Karl Marx and Marxism or Communism. Hey, let me just, before I start off here, uh, differentiate between these two words, Marxism and Communism. Karl Marx is considered to be one of the uh, creators of Communism. Hey, the other guy is this guy, Friedrich Engels. Both these guys with pretty impressive beards. Both of these guys German. Uh, communism is the political and economic theory developed by, Fried by Marx and Engels. Uh, but communism will go through several ev evolutions uh, throughout political history. Uh, Vladimir Lenin will come around and have his own version of communism, which we tend to just simply call Leninism. Uh, but uh, but the original form of communism is is also called Marxism. So uh, hopefully that clears things up there. Hey, so there's Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. These two guys in the middle of the 19th century uh, are the co creators of the political and economic theory of communism. Friedrich Engels spent a lot of time in England, uh, in London in particular, where he spent time with the utopian socialists uh, like Robert Owens, being very influenced by them. Uh, Friedrich Engels uh, wrote his own communist uh, theories and his own communist works, uh, but Karl Marx's are the ones that are the most famous, and so those are the ones that we focus on. Um, Friedrich Engels was very influenced by the utopian socialist Karl Marx, very influenced by this political, his, well, I guess historical philosopher, uh, we remember him, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who developed his theory of the historical dialectic in which he saw each generation rebelling against the generation before and, uh, and, the, and the following generation uh, synthesizes the two previous generations. And uh, what we have with the Hegelian historical dialectic is a movement throughout history, a positive movement throughout history. To be a Hegelian in the early 19th century meant that you were a liberal. You believed that history was moving forward. You believed that people were becoming increasingly more free. So you didn't trust Metternich and the Concert of Europe because you didn't think once the genie of freedom had been released that you could ever stuff that genie back in the bottle. History is constantly moving forward. So Hegel, if you remember, believed that history was moving forward because of God, that a spirit, or as he called it in his native German, a Geist was moving history. Uh, that's that this God was the one who's propelling history. Whereas Karl Marx doesn't believe that. Karl Marx, although born into a Jewish family, was himself an atheist. And he did not believe that there was a God that was moving history or a spirit or a geist. Instead, the way he looked at history and how he takes Hegel's idea and applies it is he gets rid of the spirit, he gets rid of the geist, and he focuses on strictly materialism. All there is on earth is simply stuff. There's just stuff. There's stuff that can be possessed. There's property. So Karl Marx gets rid of this historical dialectic and instead refines it to a material dialectic. So the way Marx looks at history is there's human beings and human beings throughout history have competed with each other to control and have stuff. There's competition for property, and it's this competition for property which moves history. So 
human beings in competition with each other. Uh, it is worth noted, noting that Karl Marx was influenced in part a little bit by Charles Darwin. Uh, and these two guys uh, present the two most important philosophies of the mid 19th century, uh, Marxism and, uh, and, and, and Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, as an example of how influenced Marx was by Charles Darwin, when Marx produced his magnum opus, Das Kapital, in the late 1860s, he took a first edition and he sent it to England, to Charles Darwin, with an inscription written in English uh, showing his admiration for Charles Darwin. So, Marx. Let's look at how Marx looks at the evolution of history throughout all humankind and where he sees history going, and of course that will lead to his theory of communism. So, human beings throughout history, where did it all begin? So Karl Marx says, once upon a time, a long, 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 long time ago, in prehistorical times, there were people without property. And these people were sort of the original communist. They didn't really have stuffs. There was common ownership. And at the dawn of humanity, whenever he believes that was, this is what all human beings were like. And it's sort of hard to argue against this. At some point in time in history, there was no property, there was no money, there was no government. Uh, we were essentially entirely free and we lived in, in, in small communities. Like these people here. So just to let you know, this image that you're looking at here are Aborigine Australians. These are the indigenous people of Australia. Uh, their culture goes back 40,000 years, which is, I believe makes them the oldest uh, continuous civilization on earth. So, so then what happens? Well, at some point in time in history, greed had to happen to some people. Not obviously everybody, but some communities developed greed. At some point in time, somebody wanted to have more than others. Somebody wanted to control other people. So we have kings emerge, an, an aristocratic class, or something like this. But with some communities, greed emerges. And one way you can understand Karl Marx's philosophy is just identifying greed as something that's purely bad, purely evil, and creates destruction in societies and throughout Earth. And the ultimate goal of, of Karl Marx and his political and economic philosophy is to get rid of greed. That's a really basic, simple way to understand Marxism. So, okay, so what happens then? In a society where somebody gets greedy, wants to have more property, more wealth, or something than others, however that had evolved, you create a structure in society. And Karl Marx uses these terms. He says, in all societies, there's those that have stuff, and we're gonna call them the haves. And then there are those that don't have as much as the, the haves, and those are the have-nots. Um, this seems like, these terms seem very oversimplified, but these are actually the terms that Karl Marx used. There are the haves, and there are the have-nots. Now, throughout a different period of time in history, the haves and the have-nots were different people. We identified them differently. So throughout most of European history, we've talked about the aristocracy, and I guess we could call them royalty in with them. There's the aristocracy. Those were the haves. Those were the people who controlled property, and usually lots of property, lots of wealth. And then there were those that worked for the aristocracy that sort of were uh, serfs or tenants on the land at some point in time. And these were, of course, the peasants. So there's the structure of society. It's an economic and social structure. There's those with land, power, property, the haves, which are the aristocracy, and there's those without this stuff, and those are the peasants. And then at some point in time, a revolution comes along. The peasants have had enough, and they finally decide that they're going to rise up against their aristocratic masters. And usually something desperate happens. Uh, the peasants grow increasingly impoverished and they become increasingly desperate. So they decide to rise up. So, you know, for Karl Marx, the big rising up in European history was 1789, the French Revolution, which in part explains why he uses uh, French terms to describe this evolution of humanity. So once the peasants rise up and we have a democratic revolution, woohoo, we're 
the, the, the aristocracy is gone. I mean, we can think about our own country's history in the United States. We don't have aristocratic titles anymore. It was part of our revolution in the 1770s. We got rid of dukes and earls and counts, as well as kings and queens. So, but this doesn't mean, even though the peasants rise up, that we change the fundamental structure of society. What happens in the early 19th century then, according to Karl Marx, once you get rid of uh, uh, this traditional structure of society, of aristocracy and peasants, is sort of the same thing with new names. You've got now the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The bourgeoisie, uh, and, and this is the product of, of democracy and of free trade and of what Karl Marx called capitalism. You've got uh, those that have money uh, and have jobs where they can make money and control other people. And then there's the proletariat, those that work for them. So these are the two terms that, that Karl, Marx is, Karl Marx uses. You've got the bourgeoisie. Now, according to Karl Marx, the bourgeoisie are the people who, and these are his terms, control the means of production. So these are the people who control the wealth, control the property, and control the jobs. And then there's the proletariat. Now, here's a fancy, funky word that Karl Marx uses to control the proletariat and what they do. He identifies, Karl Marx identifies all human beings as homophobers. Homophobers is a word which means one who makes. Now, when we think of human beings, we call them homo sapiens, which means one who thinks. But Karl Marx says the thinking part is not the essential ingredient of being a human being. It's production. It's production. And understanding human beings as people who, or things who produce, helps us to understand how the bourgeoisie are ripping off the proletariat. So let's use these two stereotypes, which are honestly the stereotypes that pop into my mind when I think about Marxism and communism. So on the top there, you've got these two businessmen, these two guys wearing their suits. And, you know, what are they doing? Well, they're buying and selling things. They're controlling property. They're controlling the jobs. They're not actually really physically doing anything other than controlling and managing the property. These individuals, according to Karl Marx, would control the means of production. But then let's look at the humble manual laborer, the construction worker below. There's the guy who's actually doing things. There's the homo faber, the one who makes. Now for Karl Marx, this was a very emotional thing for the construction worker on the bottom. Imagine uh, your family decides that they want to uh, create a new kitchen, something like that. They want to put in a new kitchen. They want to redo their kitchen. Well, your family then, if they've got the money and the capital to have a new kitchen built in their house, that means they control the means of production. And they're going to hire people to come in and make the kitchen. But the actual making is a very intimate thing. If our part of our essence of being a human being is production. So, you know, here come these construction workers in, these designers and these uh, other manual laborers who come in and, you know, they rip everything out. And they install your new sink and your new granite countertops and the new light installations and the cabinets that they made. You know, they install all this, but then they have to leave it and they get paid. Uh, I don't know. They, they probably would say, I don't get paid enough for this, this great craftsmanship. So, and so Karl Marx understood that these people felt like what they were making, it's essentially their babies and their babies are being taken away from them by the people who can't make them, but for by the people who could literally control the means of production. So hopefully I'm not going into too much depth, but here with this uh, idea, but, uh, and hopefully you're following along, but this is what Karl Marx saw as essentially starting in part the revolution that the people who are actually making the stuff don't actually get to enjoy the fruits of their labors. All right, so moving on. How Karl Marx then saw the evolution of society then is with the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie would become fewer and fewer. There would be fewer individuals who, control, who would control the incredible amount of wealth and incredible amount of, of property. Um, these would be the, the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. These would be the individuals with a lot of wealth and a lot of money. And then the proletariat class, he views as growing in greater and greater and greater numbers until it creates a desperate situation 
where the majority of people are living in poverty and there's a handful of people who are protecting their wealth uncaring to the masses. Now, for Marx, this is what's going to create the revolution. What you need to think about is, is this how society evolves? When you have a capitalist society, will the number of bourgeoisie the upper bourgeoisie shrink and shrink and shrink and the number of proletariat grow and grow and grow. Is this how history will evolve till there's, uh, it reaches fever pitch and the proletariat rise up in revolution uh, to kill the few bourgeoisie and redistribute their wealth? Is this how his history will evolve? And Marxists themselves look at this and struggle, um, especially in the late 19th century. They would argue about, is this how history is evolving or are we creating what we Americans would call a middle class, and that it's not just a few bourgeoisie and a whole lot of proletariat, but there's actually a significant middle class that's being created out of a free market capitalist democratic system. Well, Karl Marx predicted that no, the proletariat class would grow, they'd become incredibly desperate, and eventually they would rise up and we'd have a revolution of the proletariat. So what's this mean? It means that the proletariat get together, the bourgeoisie have the guns, but the proletariat have the number, have the numbers, they rise up, they kill the bourgeoisie, they confiscate all their property, and they begin the process of redistributing wealth and property. According to Karl Marx, when's this going to happen? Well, soon. He saw the mid and late 19th century as a time of incredible desperation, incredible poverty. He thought it was just inevitable people are going to rise up. And where is it going to happen? Well, he predicted England. Why England? Well, because England was the most industrialized society um, with, their, you know, their, with their huge booming cities of Manchester, Leeds, Bristol, Newcastle. He's like, the poor people there, they're, they're eventually going to rise up. Okay, so the proletariat rise up, they kill the rich people, they confiscate their wealth. What happens next? All right, so communism doesn't happen automatically. There's sort of a first stage of communism, and it's called socialism. So what is socialism? So Karl Marx predicted that during the revolution, the proletariat would rise up and they would confiscate all the property. And then essentially, all the property would belong commonly to all people. So, but of course, the, that means that the government or the state is controlling all the property, whereas the people are controlling the state. So you have a government, you have an economy, you have money, but the government controls everything. Uh, it's worth noting that, uh, that, that Marx uh, drew a lot from Rousseau's concept of the general will when he talks really in very, very general terms, just like Rousseau only wrote in very general terms, about a government representing the will of the people and the government using the property uh, and the wealth of a country as the people would want them to do so. So what's this mean um, in terms of you know practically how does this work out? Well, let's take the example of your car and your home. Uh, if there was a communist revolution, you would not actually own your home or your car anymore. Those things would be the possession of the state. That way, you can't be super rich and go have you know your multiple homes in Vail and in Naples and in Los Angeles or wherever else you want all these homes, and you're not going to have Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all that while other people starve. That's just not fair. Greed is evil, according to Karl Marx. So the way we eliminate that is the government controls everything. And then the government would give you a home or a car based upon your need. So how much do you need? Uh, what do you need? The government will determine this. And of course, the government is supposed to represent the general will of the entire society. All right. The government will also give you a job and they will give you a job based upon your ability. So who are you? What are you good at? Where can you best serve society? The government will determine this. 
So you can imagine a communist uh, 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 educational system in which your abilities are identified by the state and you are put to work based upon uh, your ability. So if you're good at math, you know, you're going to go maybe into engineering or something like that. Uh, if you're good at uh, knowing stories from history, maybe you're going to become a teacher. So you know, the government's going to provide you a, a job based upon your ability. All right, which helps us to understand this general phrase from Karl Marx that in a communist society, uh, or in this first stage of, social, uh, of socialism, you will be placed to work, each according to his ability, each according to his need. And this creates the ideal society where all live in harmony for a long, long time. Okay. So, in a socialist society, you still have money. There is still currency for trade and exchange and buying and selling and all of that. There is still money. So in a socialist society, ideally everybody gets paid the same amount and then you use that money as you want. And then government still exists. But this isn't the final stage. Karl Marx imagines that after you've got this dictatorship of the proletariat, which is probably led by one dictator who represents the general will of the people, who has been redistributing wealth evenly for an extended period of time, decades go by, maybe, I don't know, it, it, Karl Marx never specifies how long this is going to last, but let's just say decades, you know, you're, you're getting, everybody's getting paid the same, the government's telling everybody what to do, where to, how to, where to work, and, and, and the government's distributing things based upon need. Well, at a certain point, this concept of money becomes irrelevant. This concept of property becomes irrelevant. What Karl Marx predicts will happen will be that the human race will start to go back to this prehistoric mindset where there is no greed. We still, have all, we still have all the stuff of a post-industrialized society. We still have houses, we still have cars, we still have smartphones or whatever, but we don't have greed. This can be essentially conditioned out of human beings after prolonged socialism. So after prolonged socialism, we have communism. We get rid of money and we get rid of government. And the second stage of communism Greed has been eliminated, the proletariat dictator will step down, and everything will run smoothly. We bring back these prehistoric values in a post-industrialized society. And this is the general philosophy of Karl Marx. He's got two big books that you need to know about. The first isn't much of a book, as more of it is a pamphlet. It's pretty short. It's the Communist Manifesto. It was published in that revolutionary year of 1848. And the Communist Manifesto really is a call to arms. Uh, the Communist Manifesto gives you the lens by which you can look at society and you can see a handful of wealthy people controlling and exploiting and ripping off and destroying the lives of the poor, the proletariat, and the, how easy it would be for all the proletariat just to band together and to rise up from the few, to storm their mansions and to kill them and to confiscate their property and equally distribute everything. Uh, it is the kind of the, the, the drum of communism, the Communist Manifesto. A couple phrases that come out of the Communi Communist Manifesto. I'm going to give you the first sentence and the last sentence of this book. Uh, and the first sentence is this. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. And uh, this opening phrase is uh, kind of, you know, it's, it's putting you in, the, in Karl Marx's mind. He's, we're, we're getting the, the lens of how we're going to look at the world. Uh, that, you know, we've got these masses of people and boy, they're ready to rise up. And then the last sentence of the book, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. If only the proletariat would get together. Quit seeing differences between themselves. Uh, quit worrying about things like nationalism. You know, it doesn't matter if you're German, French, English, or Italian. You know, if you're poor, you're poor, you're poor, you're poor. And it's the same situation in each country. you got rich people who are exploiting the poor. So we need to get rid of this nationalist mindset. We need to embrace the proletariat mindset. 
we need to think in terms of socioeconomic class and when the poor people unite. And once all the poor people of the world unite and they rise up against a handful of rich and they kill them and they redistribute the wealth, we will have a completely new world. And man, if you're poor, this might actually sound really, really, really good. His second big book is Das Kapital. And, and the Communist Manifesto is not a big book, but Das Kapital is a huge just cinder block of a book that outlines his whole theory of capitalism. So what I've gone over in this slideshow, he goes over in, of course, much, 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 much more depth and explaining how it can work, how it can work. It's fun to know that one word that he coins in the book Das Kapital is capitalism. This word capitalism, which, we, which many people use to describe the American economy, uh, and other free market uh, economies uh, it was actually coined by Karl Marx. What was capitalism called before Karl Marx came around? Well, laissez-faire economics or free trade. Um, in England, there were the people who pushed for what we call a capitalist economic system, and these were the free traders. So guys, this is the story of Karl Marx and communism, a pretty brief overview, but I hope it gave you a good sense of what communism is. It will have no small impact on world history. Communism is an ideology that will go on to have an incredible impact on the history of the world and, of course, on everything else that we study from here on out in our AP European history adventure. Thanks, guys. See you in class.